Hello, everyone. I'm going to wait for some, some attendees to get into the room. I see you coming into the room right now. Uh, for those watching live, um, yep, I see you all coming in. We're going to wait a little bit. My name is Nicolas Polimonakos. Um, I work behind the scenes here at ESAR as social media manager, website manager, and a whole host of other tasks. And today I am uh, helping out and hosting this um, webinar by Steve Judd. Steve, how are you? I'm still alive, Nicholas. <laughs> yeah, that means I am too, right? Yes. <laughs> that's the theory. Yeah, that's the theory. So, yeah, good to see you, Steve. We'll wait. We'll wait a little bit here because we we have a a great turnout already so far. I can see you, everyone, coming into the room, uh, and we'll we'll wait till some people settle in. Um, in the meantime. Uh, speaking about the organization and ESAR, for those of you watching live and for those of you uh, watching later who are members of the organization, you know that we've only had a temporary website here since June and that we've been planning and working on a new website here, which Hermes willing will be uh, launched by the end of the month. And that is something I'm personally working behind the scenes on with the team. So just want to let people know that in the meantime, since June, we've made all our webinars free to watch live. Um, if you're interested in, in watching any other of the webinars the next couple of weeks that will be free to view live, uh, you can go to esarastrology.com. You'll see the temporary page I have up there. There's a webinars uh, in different languages, uh, Turkish, Greek, French this week. Uh, and our English USA USA based ones and the UK ones and all other things there you could see it. So, um, all right, I'm seeing people coming in chat here, and uh, we've got people from all over the world. Looks like I think that's how uh, that's how people know you, huh, Steve? All over the world. Isn't that the beauty of the internet? I'm old enough to remember when it was just black and white televisions and dial up telephones. And now we've got this. This. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing. Actually, it's mind blowing to me that we could do this. Um, so, uh, okay. I'm going to uh, get settled here and, and um, formally start this with an introduction. And here we are, Steve Judd. Steve has studied astrology since 1977, is self-taught and was awarded the MA in Cultural Astronomy and Astrology in 2005. In 45 years, he has records of over 40,000 horoscope readings with a large and loyal client base. He is a published author on astrology and has a large number of astrological students in his weekly online classes. Steve's idiosyncrasies endear him to his clients, which coupled with his bohemian and direct attitude makes him a unique astrologer. Hello, Steve. Hello, Nicholas. <laughs> um, Head of an introduction. I must yes. have introduced when I wrote that. <laughs> um, I'll let you take it away here. I want to be in the background. Okay, Steve? And Fine. Yep. Okay, so look, let me just make one or two of my own rules here, okay? This is for everyone listening. Many of you I know, those of you I don't, it's the same for everyone. Um, I'm going to burble on now for quite a long time. Feel free to ask questions, but I won't answer them until the end of the session, okay? And um, I will not answer questions on personal charts. That's, that's my business. So, you know. So what I want to do... Um, when I wrote the blurb for this, I wrote something about, oh, how I'm going to look at this from a neo-modernistic view and decry the modernist system and look at um, the pluralistic view of Pluto as we merge into... The... And I, I look back on this now, nine months after I wrote it, and I thought, what the hell was I writing here? I'd just come out of a, a, a big academic session, so I was very familiar with those terms at the time. Now I've had to sort of really review my, my my own words and work out what the hell of a difference is between modernism, postmodernism, neo-modernism, pluralism, 
because if I've got a master's degree, I'm not an academic and I'm a practicing astrologer. So I don't know everything about astrology. My students actually know more about astrology than I do, but I'm I haven't got time to learn all this because I'm practicing all the time. I'm actually doing readings. So from what I know is that modernism, as I understand modernism, was he's been around about 100, 150 years. It's the trend of thought that permits humans to improve, shape and create their environment um, with the help of science, knowledge and technology and to find out what holds back progress and replace it with new ways to reach the same end. Whereas postmodernism rejects modernism and the scientific certainty um, and it's sceptical of the one size fits all narrative. It rejects existing principles in favor of direct experience. Neo-modernism is where truth exists in a kind of universal form. It refutes existentialism and postmodernist views that, that the essence of existence is formed by observed bias. So neo-modernism are kind of one, sit, one size fits all. Pluralism gives the diversity of views. So I'm coming at Pluto from a kind of neo-modernist perspective where, where uh, truth exists in a universal form, but from a pluralist perspective where there's a diversity of views as well. Right, that's the academic stuff. Now, long ago, when Uranus was discovered in the mid seventy, early mid 1760s, it was a revolution in consciousness because up until that time, we'd only had the planets out to Saturn and they were all visible with the naked eye. All of a sudden, there's a new planet and it was Uranus, originally, well, it became Uranus after a few years and it pretty quickly became associated with the ideas of revolution and change. In 1840, Neptune was discovered. And then over the next 50, 40, 50 years, the orbits of Neptune and Pluto, of Neptune and Uranus were, were calculated and observed. And gradually the realization dawned amongst astronomers that their orbits were not as they were predicted to be. Therefore, the astronomers at the time postulated that there was a third planet outside the orbit of Neptune that was big enough to pull Neptune and Uranus away from being perfectly round orbit. And they called this planet X. And a number of astronomers spent lifetimes looking for the mysterious planet X. One of these astronomers was a guy called Percival Lowell. Um, note the initials, PL. And he never found this planet X, but during the 1900s, early 1900s, 1900 to about 1903, 1904, he postulated that when planet X was discovered and the telescopes were strong enough to discover it, it would be found in a particular position, this particular spot. Right, he died and um, he died quite young. And um, about 10 years later, and um, the search for Planet X continued in the choir in the background. In 1930, the Pasadena Observatory uh, opened and was one of the young bucks at this Pasadena Observatory, a guy called Clyde Tomba, was charged with carrying on Lowell's work. And he rejected the advice of his superiors to look in, in different constellations and instead followed Lowell's suggestion to look where he thought it would be. And over a period of time, Tomba realized that he was spotting something in the constellation of Gemini that wasn't, that was moving, but not in the way that stars move. And he thought that he'd found a comet at first, but then it was realized that it was this so-called planet X. And this was in 1930. So, 
first, first digression of this lecture. Let me tell you the story of how Pluto got its name. The myth goes that Tormba went home after discovering Pluto that week and said to his children, hey, kids, I've discovered a new planet. What shall I call it? And they had just been watching the first of the Walt Disney movies in 1930. And they went, hey, Daddy, call it Pluto, after the name of the dog in the Disney movies. And so Tormba went, oh, that's a good idea. So he called it Pluto. Now, that's the myth. It's not true. Because in the first four Disney movies in 1930 and 1931, the dog was called Rex. Ben Sharpstein, the original animator of the Disney movies in the 1930s and 1940s, said that one day Walt Disney came up and said, I'm changing the name of the dog to Pluto or in 1932. Why Disney chose to change that dog's name from Rex to Pluto was not recorded. So where did the name for Pluto come from for the planet? Well, Tormba went to the people at the American Astronomical Union, the people who run this observatory said, okay, I found this planet, what should we call it? And they put it out to tender. And a lot of people, particularly Percival Lowell's wife, who had, had really stymied the opening of the observatory because she laid claim to all of Lowell's work. And she wasn't a particularly nice person. Um, she said, okay, she wanted it called Percival or Lowell, or even better, Constance after her. Other people suggested it should be called Minerva. And there was lots of different names. And they weren't sure on what to call it. So... They farmed it out to the European Astronomical Union or whatever it was called in that day. And the head of that was oh, Falconer, Marden Falconer, something like this. And uh, he was at Oxford one day having meals with people of the, the English Astronomical Association. And um, he was talking to Professor George Burney, who was an expert in Greek mythology and was also a keen amateur astrologer. And during that meal, his granddaughter, Professor Bernie's granddaughter, v Venetia Bernie, who at that young age of about 10 was already versed in Greek mythology, overheard them talking and interrupted their meal and said, Granddad, why don't we call it Pluto? It's invisible, it's in the dark, and it's hidden from view. Let's call it Pluto. And they all went, well, that's a good idea. So they sent it back to the American Astronomical Union and said, let's call it Pluto, shall we? And they looked at it and went, oh, Pluto begins with PL after Percival Lowell. So they put it to a vote of the entire American Astronomical Union, along with the names Minerva and I think Constance, and it was unanimously decided to call it Pluto. And that's the truth of how Pluto got its name. Now, I know this to be true because one of my colleagues who happens also to work for ISA and one of the few British astrologers I've got a great deal of time and respect for is a friend of mine called Alex Trinaweth. And she did a lot of research on the naming of Pluto and she actually made contact with Venetia Burney shortly before she died and ascertain the truth of a discovery of Pluto. And I have no reason to doubt her. Before I go too deeply into the stuff around the discovery of Pluto and the subsequent developments associated with it, and uh, the names of the planets, the astronomy of the Pluto system, the astrology of the Pluto system, I want to talk some particularly about um, a particular facet that seems to be becoming stronger and stronger in terms of its association with plutonic energy. And that is the stuff around synchronicity. Nine months ago, I met up with Alex Trinauf and she said, Steve, would you like to give a lecture at ISAR? And I went, yeah, sure, why not? 
she said, what would you like to do it on? And I thought, well, Pluto. I was just finishing writing my update on my book on Pluto. And I thought, well, that's a nice touch. I'll do it on Pluto. So that's when I came up with the, with the words for, the, for, the, for tonight's lecture. Um, little did I know that just as I do this workshop, my new book on Pluto, The Law of Pluto Exploring the Void, is about to be republished. Now, I published this initially in 2014, before the New Horizons probe hit Pluto. I published it when it was about nine months away from Pluto. I rewrote this in the last nine months, and it got published Pre-publication copies got published last week, and I got 200 of them to give to my students and sign copies. It's out on October the 10th worldwide. Um, the fact that I'm doing a workshop on Pluto at the time of my Pluto book coming out, to me, is another classic example of synchronicity. I never planned this. An even stronger example of the synchronicity is that right now, at this moment of time, in the sky, the moon in the sky right now is at 25 degrees of Leo. My Pluto is at 25 degrees of Leo. When I start talking about this level of synchronicity, I start getting shivers up my spine. Um, Pluto is, it works in mysterious ways. Now, if you're going to ask me, to give a scientific explanation of how a planet smaller than our moon and 4 billion miles away, 4 billion miles away, has such a powerful effect upon us as individuals, I'm not going to be able to give you it. I can burble on about particle and wave and quantum mechanics, but the truth is, if you ask me to scientifically explain how Pluto works, I can't. But do I know it? Absolutely. I know it works. And the synchronicity of this workshop tonight reaffirms that knowing. If I could explain astrology, I wouldn't do it anymore. I like the not knowing. I like the working with pattern recognition, the psychology, the instinct, the intuition, as well as the mathematics and the geometry. And it's a true mixture of science and art. If you could explain it, it wouldn't be fun anymore. I could show you how other planets work. I could show you the marine life with the moon. I can show you how Jupiter, you can hear it on the shortwave radio. And so if that is hitting the radio, it's hitting us. But Pluto, hmm, another story. But let's come back to the discovery of Pluto. There's this developing theme in astrology over the last 250, 300 years, 250 years, of how as planets get discovered, so the circumstances of what's going on in the world at that time dictate their archetypes, or maybe their archetypes dictate what's going on in the world. It's a kind of quid pro quo. When Uranus was discovered, it was the time of the French Revolution, the American Revolution, the birth of people like Faraday, who, who started developing electricity. And this all fits with Uranus's concepts of being sparky, electrical, revolutionary, futuristic, innovative, original, and sometimes downright unpredictable. When Neptune was discovered in 1840, it was the onset, it was the first drug wars, with the opium wars in China. It was the onset of mesmerism, hypnotism. It was the first commercial brewing of alcohol. Um, it was the development of spirituality. All of this was taking place in the early 1840s. When Pluto was discovered in 1930, well, in 1929, we had the underworld crime wave in america um the mafia the the, the 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 gangs in the big cities and it's very much an underworld development and an underworld is very much a word that's used with pluto um 
Uh, also in the 19th, early 1930s, at the time of Pluto's discovery, we had people like Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer Heisenberg, Pauli, Fermi, Teller, all working with the development of um, atomic technology. We had Rutherford splitting the neutron. We had Glenn Seaborg discovering the new element, which he named after the planet and became plutonium. All of this was happening. And of course, the most e e classic example uh, of development at Pluto's discovery was that this was also the time where Carl Jung, the perhaps proponent of the most modern form of psychology we know, and also an extremely talented astrologer, was, was bringing psychology into the world. Prior to 1929, 1930, psychology was limited to Freud and all of his theories. Jung revolutionized astronomy, ast astrology and psychology. So um, here you see the archetypes of Pluto with the underworld, with the uh, microscopic, the, the neutronic, the atomic, and with the psychological beginning to take place. And this idea of planets being named in accordance with what's going on at the time is actually repeated further on down the chain. The planetoid, Chiron, which is not acceptable to many astrologers, but which I work with extensively, uh, was discovered in 1978, 79. And with it came this idea of healing and wounding, of um, disintegration, dichotomy, fragmentation, and also integration, assimilation, and holism. And who, prior to 1978, was working with things like aromatherapy, astrology, homeopathy, reflexology, whereas post-1978-79, the, the gap between the allopathic and the naturopathic ways of medicine has grown exponentially, and more and more people now are either using them both or even waking up purely just to naturopathic forms of healing. So this is a theme over the millennia as planets named, so there are as planets are named, so their archetypes become more established. And this is certainly the case with Pluto. Let's stick with the astronomy just for a little bit more. Pluto was discovered in 1930, we know this, but it quickly became obvious that Pluto was far too small to be the big planet that everyone thought it was that was pulling Neptune out of its orbit, that was creating the irregularities in Neptune's orbit. So... As space travel developed, so probes were sent into the solar system. And on the 25th of August, 1989, the Voyager 2 probe created a flyby of Neptune. As a result of the information sent back by that Voyager 2 flyby, it was subsequently proved that the previous calculations, which led to the erratic orbit of Neptune being postulated, was actually false, and that there was nothing wrong with Neptune's orbit. Therefore, there was no need for a planet X or another planet outside of Neptune to put it out of orbit. Nevertheless, Pluto was discovered. What was not known at the time of its discovery or in the next 50 to 60 years was that Pluto was actually a trans-Neptunian planet. And it was the first of many much smaller planets to be discovered in later years. But certainly from 1930 through to almost the end of the millennium, Pluto was seen as the 10th planet. And to many astrologers, it still is the 10th planet. A mission to Pluto was planned and launched. But in the time between planet the Pluto, the New Horizons probe being launched to the time it actually hit Pluto, which was a large number of years because of the distance that it had to fly, 
A number of other protoplanets beyond the orbit of Pluto were discovered, Eris, Sedna, to name a few. And it was realized that there was a large number of bodies beyond Neptune in what was then called the Kuiper Belt, of which Pluto was merely one. In fact, Pluto is not even the biggest. It's one of the biggest. It's the second biggest. As a result, the International Astronomical Union, in their wisdom, in 2006, relegated Pluto from a planet to a dwarf planet, which upset astrologers all around the world. And um, as a result, um, astronomers and scientists no longer took Pluto seriously because they realized it was just one of a large number of different planets beyond Neptune, all of them small, some of them even not round. And this is where astronomy and astrology digress massively. I mean, astronomy and astrology were the same thing until the invention of a telescope. There are a number of, there's at least three states in the US of A that still consider Pluto to be a major planet. Most astrologers see Pluto as a planet. I could not conceive of doing a horoscope without using Pluto, or for that matter, Chiron, or for that matter, the asteroid Ceres. There are a number of traditional astrologers who will not use any of the outer planets. They stop at Saturn. That's their choice. Um, as I've aged and as I've worked with Pluto more and more, I kind of, and this is going to be anathema to many of you, I know, but I realise that when you consider that there's other planets out there in the Kuiper Belt that are bigger than Pluto, I understand why the Astronomical Union relegated Pluto to dwarf planet status. But that doesn't change the fact that its astrological influence is absolutely immense, unlike any of the other Kuiper Belt objects. There are ephemerises out there for Sedna and Eris and, and other uh, uh, any uh, other bodies, but they don't have anything like the effect that Pluto has. So this is one of the anomalies around Pluto. Once the New Horizons probe had been launched, NASA directed the Hubble Space Telescope and other land and space-based telescopes to explore the Pluto system to make sure that the New Horizons probe wasn't going to hit anything on its way. One of the things I neglected to say here is that whereas all the other planets out to Neptune they all were, they all occupy the same plane of the zodiac, give or take one or two degrees. They all spin round the sun like that. One or two of them are slightly different, especially Mercury when it's retrograde, but basically they all spin round in a fairly clear, tight plane of the, of the solar system. Pluto doesn't, it goes like that. Right, so it's at a considerable different angle to the rest of the plane of the solar system. And therefore, it only crosses the plane of the solar system for about five years at a time, every 125 years. And it was during one of those crosses of the solar system that Clyde Tomba actually found Pluto in Gemini. In order for the New Horizons probe to get a clear run at Pluto, NASA had to work out exactly the right orbit so that it didn't hit any of the bodies in space between the probe and Pluto. So what they did, they did a lot of work on the Plutonic system. And there's a number of factors that have come to light in this last decade, which, is, which again, belie rationality. The synchronicity here is incredible. First of all, Charon, the main moon of Pluto. Charon is a third, maybe even almost half the size of Pluto. And it's so close to Pluto that Charon goes around Pluto, I think it's two times for every one time that Pluto goes around Charon. They're in a bari, baricentric orbit. And here's the strange thing. Pluto spins on its axis 
every 6.4 days. Charon orbits Pluto every 6.4 days. So what this means is that the same face of Charon is always facing the same face of Pluto in their orbits. The only other the only other thing in the solar system that's anything like this is our moon. Our moon always shows the same face to the Earth because it spins on its axis once every 29 days. It goes around the Earth every 29 days. But this is only 10% of the story. Both Charon and Pluto pull each other out of a perfect orbital pattern around each other. So actually, it's like... It's like a ring donut. So you've got Charon on the outside of the ring donut, Pluto on the inside of the ring donut. In the center of the Plutonic system that they are both orbiting is a void, a darkness, nothing. So they're orbiting the void. Once the NASA telescopes got out there and started realizing what was coming up, they found the Plutonic other the, the other moons of Pluto. They found um, sticks named after the river. Styx. There's the river that the souls cross to get to Hades. They found um, Nix, spell N-I-X. Uh, Nix was the goddess of the night, mother of Sharon, but they spelled it N-I-X rather than N-Y-X because there was always an, already an asteroid called Nix, N-Y-X. Beyond Nix, they found the asteroid Hydra, which was named after the nine-headed beast that was slain by Hercules, who, who was actually the nephew of Pluto. And then they found, um, outside of Hydra, they found Kerobos, named after Cerebos, the many-headed dog that guarded Pluto's, uh, guarded the gateway to Hades. But they named it with a K rather than a C because there was already an asteroid named Cerebos. But what's amazing here is the exact ratios of their orbit. What was found and has been proven since that day is that Styx, Nix and Hydra are in a three-body resonance with each other that is precise 11 9 6 this means that in a recurring cycle there are 11 orbits of sticks for every nine orbits of nix and every six orbits of hydra this is precise and this degree of accuracy along with a barycentric and tidily locked relationship between Sharon and pluto should be enough to keep geometrists, numerolog numerologists, and astrologers busy for decades to come. Coincidences like this don't happen in a diverse solar system. For that degree of accuracy, it suggests that there's something else at foot here. And for those of you who are already my students, I've shown you many examples of the stellar geometry, of the sacred geometry of the solar system, which proves to an extent, well, it does prove, that the positions and orbital rotational patterns of the planets are not random. What that means, I choose not to speculate on, but it proves that there is order in the solar system. So the Pluto system we now know is much stranger than we previously thought. So New Horizons hits, comes very close to Pluto and it flies by in a space of a few hours, 14 years for a few hours. But in those few hours, some of the photos, some of the stuff around the astronomy of Pluto is spectacular. We now know that Pluto is a mixture of um, frozen rock and ice. Here's the weird one. There are no craters on Pluto. So its surface is young, less than 10 million years old. There's no craters. Nothing's hit it. Which, unlike any other rock planet, is pretty weird. Um, the ice is not ice sheets. It comes up from underneath and it comes up inside of polyagonal cells, which then form into five or six sided shapes and then push up against the mountains. And there is an element, uh, the ice is white, the rock, the mountains are black. The mountains are basically carbon. 
There's also an element of orange in some of the rocks as well, but we only have the photos of one half of the face of Pluto. So we can't say for sure that the other side of it has no craters. This is speculation. What was beautiful is that as the New Horizons probe left the Pluto system, it turned its cameras back for one last picture. And it took a picture of Pluto eclipsing the sun. So all you could see was this black circle with the sunlight behind it. And that illuminated a very bright electrical blue ring around Pluto, proving that Pluto has an atmosphere that is 98% nitrogen and the rest of it is a mixture of carbon monoxide and methane. So Pluto has given up a lot of its astronomical secrets. The mythology of Pluto. Here we go back. Much of Western astrology, much of contemporary Western astrology, gets its mythology from the Greek. With the origins of Greek mythology, you have the, the three original deities, the, the unnameable one that the Egyptians called Aum. You have Gaia, the Earth goddess, and Uranus, Uranus with an O in front of it, the sky god. Uranus and Gaia mated and produced the Titans, many of whom were pretty weird. The Cyclops, the Hesperides, the, the, the Medusas, they're all pretty ugly. And one of them, the most human looking of the, of, the, of the Titans, was Kronos, from where we get the word chronometer, timepiece. And Kronos is, of course, Saturn. Kronos is old father time. Kronos mated with his sister, Rhea, and produced a number of children. Um, in order for Kronos to become the king of the gods, he had to destroy his father, Uranus. So he castrated him. Greek mythology is full of sons castrating their fathers. Um, he was so scared that his children would do the same to him that he ate his children. In order, these were Hades, Hestia, uh, uh, Demeter, Poseidon, Hestia, Juno, Hera, sorry, Hera. And then the sixth child was born, Zeus, by which time Rhea was really hacked off that her husband was eating all his ch her children. So she substituted a hot rock and gave it to him instead and kept Jupiter out of Saturn's belly, kept Zeus out of Saturn's belly. In time, Zeus grew to be an adult and led the revolt of the, he, he, he confronted Kronos and opened his belly, sliced his belly open and his brothers and sisters came out. They then formed the original Olympiad, the Olympians, and they formed the, the group known as the Olympians, who then engaged the Titans in the Titanomachy, which is the war between the Olympians and the Titans. The Olympians eventually won with the help of many of the original uh, Titan monsters that had been condemned to Tartarus by Kronos. And when they won, they condemned all the monsters back into Tartarus, including Atlas, who carried the world on his shoulders. At this point, which is in many ways is synchronous with the upsurge of the patriarchy, the role of Hestia, Demeter and Hera, the Greek names, in Roman it was Hera became Juno, Hestia became Vesta and Demeter became Ceres, was written out of history. And the three men became... They split the firmament into three. And Zeus, who became Jupiter, took the overworld. Poseidon, who became Neptune in Roman, took the water world. And Hades, who became Pluto, took the underworld. Now, as Greek mythology developed, Hades was originally the realm of the dead and the lord of the dead. But gradually, over 500 years, this idea of Pluto developed, and it came from the word Pluton, P-L-O-U, 
T-O-N, um, which was the Greek way of describing the dark red stones, the rubies, um, the, the, the garnets at the base of the earth, the stones underneath the earth. And gradually the idea formed that Hades became the realm and Pluto became the lord of the realm. So Pluto was always seen as the lord of the underworld. So the story goes, at least in the Graves translation of the Greek myths, which most people refer to as authoritative. Demeter and her daughter, Ceres and her daughter, Persephone, were out picking herbs, picking food, when Pluto rushed out of the underworld in his black, ho black horses and chariot, abducted Persephone and took her into the underworld and refused to let her go. Demeter pined for her daughter and there was nothing she could do. So in the end, Demeter said, right, I'm going on strike. And she stopped the nurturing of the land. Hence, winter and the season, the winter came, everything started dying, and the gods realized that if everything died, there'd be no one left to worship them. So Zeus sent um, Mercury, uh, uh, what was his name, the fast wing messenger of the gods, Hermes in the Greek, into the underworld to try and release Persephone. And he persuaded Pluto to let Persephone go for six months of the year. But before he let her go, he gave her pomegranate seeds, which is another metaphor for impregnating her. She returned to the overworld on condition that she went back to him for six months of the year. This is the progenitor of the idea of the seasons, the dark and the light. A more contemporary version of that myth is that Pluto rescued Persephone from her evil mother and they lived in wedded bliss as king and queen of the underworld, with Persephone being the emiss emissary that went goes back into the world every six months. It's notable that the astrological Demeter, or Ceres, as she's known, is very much concerned with nurturing, but it's also to do with the smothering as as much the mothering. And that kind of fits with this later version of the Pluto myth. So, we have the astronomy of Pluto. We have the naming of the planets. We know how Pluto got its name. We know the astronomy of it. We know the stuff that was discovered around the discovery of Pluto. We can see the synchronicity of this. We also know the astronomy of the Plutonic system. And we know the mythology of Pluto. It's a very quick tour through the mythology, incidentally. It's much deeper than that. I assure you that Pluto is not the dark misogynist that he's made out to be by most of the Greek mythology. That was written in fear. So let's talk about the archetypes of Pluto, viewed from a 21st century perspective. As I repeat, I am a practicing astrologer. I don't have time to do a lot of research into the fine tuning of astrology, let alone the mythology. But I, I do have a big interest in mythology from many different cultures. So I kind of kind of work my own version of a mythology into my readings and it seems to resonate with my clients there is a obviously pluto is dark it rules scorpio it rules the eighth house you know these are the areas that people go Ooh. when i'm talking about pluto to my clients I say, look, the negative side of Pluto deals with fear, which is when you know what you're scared of. Phobia, when you know that you're scared, but not what of. And paranoia, which is the persecution complex. Pluto 
in its challenging form can be obsessive, compulsive, intense, and extreme. It can bring periods of crises and trauma into one's life. It can be manipulative, coercive, subversive. But if you love me, or you should, often, especially by transit, I say to people with strong Pluto transits, you've got to watch your back. There's people out there who have a vested interest in you remaining the same as you've always been, and they'll use all types of inappropriate or unethical influences to try and stop you changing, because if you change, they've got to change, and they don't want to change. So the negative manifestation of Pluto is, is everything that is scary to most people. When I talk to people about Pluto in their charts, I say, look, whether you like it or not, Pluto deals with the dark. Now, I don't mean dark in terms of negative. I just mean the dark. I get really hacked off with all these so-called light workers. If you can't deal with the dark, don't deal with the light. They're equal and opposite. Um, I encourage people to go into their own personal dark to go into the caves at the very bottom of their soul. And when young, under 40, well, sometimes it depends, um, before the first Pluto square, which can be as early as, at the moment, this moment time in history, it can be as early as 35, 36, or as late as 42, depending which year you were born. When going into the dark, they're like, I'm not going down there, it's dark. And there's monsters down there. And then after a large number of crises and traumas, they go, all right, all right, I'll go down there. Let's have a look. And they go into the dark and they get down and they go, blimey, it's really dark. But there's no monsters. It's just dark. So then they go down into the bottom, deepest, most caves at the bottom of their soul. And they go, right, I'm at rock bottom, at which point there's me going, right, now get the jackhammer out, keep digging, bring up all the old poison, all of it. Because the neutral side of Pluto deals with purging, detoxing, cleansing, purifying, and eliminating. Pluto is not mercenary or merciless because that is cruel and violent and vicious. But Pluto is ruthless. Not ruthless as in nasty, ruthless as in yes, no, black, white. No room for compromise or negotiation, death or rebirth, break down or break through. No middle ground. The positive side of Pluto deals with transformation, regeneration, rebirth. It is the caterpillar changing into the butterfly, the snake shedding its skin, the phoenix rising from the ashes. It is... No surprise to those astrologers who work with transits all the time that when someone's going through a difficult Pluto transit, their skin falls off, by which I mean they get athlete's foot, psoriasis, acne, eczema, dandruff. Their skin falls off. It is a snake shedding its skin. To which I always say, well, hit it with some nice aloe vera. Don't repress it or suppress it because you're only driving it back down into the underworld where it will then surface later on as an even worse problem. And this is one of the unfortunate side effects of Pluto in the Pluto in those in the lives of those people who have dealt with really difficult traumas or crises, especially in the first seven to 10 years of life where they're not able to deal with it because they're so young and there are some unspeakable traumas happen in this world they it drives they drive it so deep into their unconscious where they don't want to and can't and won't deal with it that it then will come up in 20 to 30 years time and if they don't deal with it it will then manifest in a really unpleasant way like serious illness serious illness death or life-challenging illnesses. But for those people who are willing to go into the dark, 
in an almost shamanistic way and explore their own psychology, face their demons, allow them to come up to be processed, dealt with, released and let go with kindness and love, they then become psychologically invulnerable. And that is Pluto at its best. Where you become so psychologically mature, you then become the catalyst for other people, knowing you're not the healer, because if you heal people, they just get addicted to you. But you're the catalyst. You empower others to heal themselves. And that is Pluto at its very best, where with a degree of psychological love, impersonality, objectivity, and in-depth psychoanalytical research, or and in-depth shamanistic practices, you go into the dark and you come out having faced the gates of hell and you come out invulnerable. I know this because I've been through Pluto opposite my sun and Pluto conjunct my moon, which not everybody goes through. Pluto can kill you metaphorically, but it also empowers you in a way that you previously would never even have imagined. Whilst it's beyond the range of this lecture to go into specific aspects of Pluto in terms of relating to individual planets, the actual aspects to Pluto in a birth chart are worthy of looking at. And I split these basically into three, the, the challenging, the positive and the empowering. The challenging aspects, by which I particularly mean the, square, the squares to Pluto. I consider squares to Pluto to be the most challenging of all because these force you, when young, they force you into suppression and repression. They bring so many challenges for people trying to disempower, control freakery, dominance, manipulation, violence. And the violence isn't limited to the physical it can be emotional, mental, psychological. It's nasty. But what don't kill you makes you stronger. And a square to Pluto over the years, normally by the time the first Pluto square comes up, late 30s, early 40s, will give you the opportunity to release all of those terrors and those ghosts and bring them to the surface and allow them to be dealt with to be released and to give you and by using psychology by, by i recommend all my people with difficult pluto aspects to go and buy the idiot's guide or the dummy's guide to psychology because the more you use psychology to work out what it is that makes other people think feel and behave the way they do the more you can use that same psychology as a mirror image into and onto yourself and the squares to pluto in a birth chart will push you into the dark but they will also release enough energy for you to turn those challenges over the course of a half lifetime into gifts. And there will come a time, late 30s, early 40s, where you will either then succeed in continuing to repress those energies, in which case they're going to surface in your 50s and 60s, it's something really nasty, or you'll be able to release them and let them go. The oppositions to Pluto are, are different. I, with oppositions, you can't really work with them. You have to accept them as being the way they are. It's what the French call a fate de compli. They are fixed. So when you have an opposition to Pluto, you have no choice but to acknowledge the dark worlds that exist within you as much as the light. Pluto is black and white, remember. Even the astronomy of it is black and white. Ice and dark rock. The metaphors here abound. So with the oppositions to Pluto in a birth chart, you have to own your own capacity to be compulsive or obsessive. But uh, at the same time, realize that through dealing with your own fears and allowing the dark side of your nature to surface and for you to express it in a way that is loving and acceptant, it then ceases to be so aggressive and confrontational, instead becomes more psychological. 
The trines to Pluto give a nice harmonious flow. And these are the people who have got generally good instincts. And I differentiate between instinct and intuition. In the intuition is very much a Neptunian construct. It starts at the solar plexus and goes north. Instinct is a Plutonian construct. It starts at the navel and goes south. Gut instinct. It is coming from the unconscious, the subconscious, Pluto. Um, and their instincts with the trines to Pluto are normally pretty good. The sextiles to Pluto give real windows of opportunity to work with the unconscious, the subconscious, the psychological, and to bring it daily into their lives and to encourage it in the lives of others around them. The conjunctions to Pluto are the real powerhouses of the Zodiac. Anybody with a strong planetary conjunction to Pluto, but other people are going to look at them and go, well, be careful about them. They're a witch or a wizard. They can see right through you, to which I would go, yeah, they can. If you tell them the truth, they'll deal with it. If you lie to them, even once, you're toast. Conjunctions to Pluto have got that steely-eyed gaze that can laser its way through solid steel. They've got great BS filters. Nobody can lie to them more than once. And then the sensible ones learn how to forgive, but they never forget. The transits of Pluto. It is inappropriate and unethical to be able to forecast one's death or the death of a client. And this should never happen because I don't have any truck with destiny or fate. To me, astrology is based solely on free will and self-determination. So death is a moment in time. And besides that, one of my studies of Pluto have really led me to the realization that death as we know it it's a fallacy imposed upon us by hierarchies over the last 2,000 years who have sought to control our spirituality uh, through fear of, of heaven or hell. It seems to me in this day and age that death as we've been led it to, to believe it, it doesn't exist. But death as we know it is merely a transition from one state of consciousness to another, from one dimension of existence to another. So we don't die, we just jump dimensions. And when we get there, we've either got a trauma team waiting for us or all our friends are waiting for us and they've got the party ready. And of course, if that is the case, then there is no, there's plenty of life before birth, which then raises the concept that we volunteer to come here and that the horoscope shows the mission statement and the purpose of why we volunteered to come here in the first place. But this is going off off subject here. The transits of Pluto, I see them as activators. They will either drive you so deep into your unconscious and subconscious that you get caught up in fear and you actually lose your mind because you will not or cannot deal with the traumas of the past that are urged, uh, desperate to be released. And with that suppression and repression comes increased paranoia, fear, guilt, shame, all the negative energy that's associated with Pluto at its worst. You're a bad person. You're not a good child. It's, it's pretty grim. But at the same time, transits of Pluto will help you release old patterns of behavior. They will enable you to become self-empowered in a way that previously would have seemed impossible. They will enable you to fly inside yourself. They will give you a psychological sense of self-confidence, self-belief, self-love, which in many ways is the top aspiration for all of us. 
to feel that degree of psychological sanity, stability, self-confidence and self-belief. That's the aspiration for many of us, especially those of us who are astrological practitioners or students. I see Pluto transits as gateways to personal growth and evolution. Let's step out of the personal. Let's go into the largest big scale, the global picture. I got my break with astrology. I've, I've been doing horoscopes. I, I picked up my first ephemeris in 1977. I did my first horoscope reading in 1981. I did my first horoscope reading correctly in 1982 when I found out about time changes and time zones. Um, I started doing astrology as my only source of income around 1998, 99. Since that time, astrology has been my only source of income. And I've realized that um, the patterns of astrology over recent decades have escalated. Now, I've already stated that I don't believe the placing of the planets is random and that the universe has, a, or the solar system at least, if not the universe, has a form of pattern, consciousness, purpose. There is much more to this universe than we with our tiny brains can measure. In, in, two, in 2001... Uh, a famous astrologer in Britain by the name of Jonathan Kainer, whom I knew very well, asked me to write his column when he went on holiday for a week. And I said, yeah, OK. How much? <laughs> and he paid me. And I said, yeah, I'll do it. But can I write what I want as well? Just a paragraph. And he said, yeah, fine, as long as you're not too political. I went, OK. So on the 8th of August 2011, in the Daily Mirror newspaper in England, I wrote that the coming Saturn-Pluto opposition from Sagittarius to Gemini, Saturn in Gemini opposite Pluto in Sagittarius, was going to reveal truth and lies across the world and that we are all entitled to the truth. And this was particularly going to affect the American horoscope, uh, not only uh, economically, but politically, institutionally and militarily. Four weeks later, 9-11 happened, and to my embarrassment and fear, the next day, the Daily Mirror printed, our astrologer predicted this, at which point I got a knock on my door from the security services who said, did you write this? I went, yeah. They said, are you an astrologer? I went, yeah. They said, can you prove you wrote this? I went, yeah, come in. And they came in and looked at my books and my computers, and they went, Oh, all right then. Thank you very much. Goodbye. And left me a quivering wreck before I was off to Guantanamo. Um, and since that that gave me my break, at which point Jonathan Kainer sacked me because I was getting more emails than he was. But that from that time on, I started realising that the global picture using astrology could be easily defined. Let's fast forward. Let's fast forward 20 years. The Jupiter-Saturn-Pluto conjunction at 21, 22, 23, 24 Capricorn of three years ago was clearly the harbinger of the pandemic. That's pretty much indisputable nowadays. And now... Pluto is moving out of Capricorn. We've, we've gone through the Pluto, the baby boomers and the rock stars with Virgo, the social changes of, the, of Pluto in Leo, the social changes of the 60s and early 70s with Pluto in Virgo, the divorce generation with Pluto in Libra. We thought that Pluto in Scorpio would bring nuclear war and instead it brought an end to nuclear weapons, but it also brought us HIV. When Pluto moved into Sagittarius, I thought it would be the end of religion. And sure, church attendances went down, but fundamentalism rose. With Pluto in Capricorn, I thought, great, that's the end of world government. And instead, we see the rise of the corporations and the multinationals. 
Now Pluto's moving into Aquarius, and there's lots of hopes about this, about the idea of global community. But I also suspect that with everything Plutonian, there will be an agenda in the background, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist. What's fascinating is that in the next two or three years, Pluto is going to move from Capricorn to Aquarius. This is already happening. Neptune is going to move from Pisces into Aries. Uranus is going to move from Taurus into Gemini. Saturn is going to move from Pisces into Aries the same time as Neptune. So all of the outer planets, all four of the outer planets are going to move from feminine into masculine. This has never happened before in history, ever. I've gone back 10,000 years with computer software. I've never seen the transit like this. You'd think that moving from feminine signs into masculine signs will see the rise of the military, the patriarchy. I suggest the opposite, that they'll be carrying an accrued years decades of feminine growth transformation in the unconscious the subconscious and moving it into the masculine sides which is hopefully going to bring a much greater balance gender wise throughout the world and we're seeing this today the spanish football situation is just one ex one one example of this There's also going to come a time. Now, I do a work, I do a bit of work for planetary development with heliocentric astrology, not geocentric, earth-centered, but helio with sun-centered. And there is a time where we're going to have Pluto, Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, Jupiter, Mercury, all within the first one or two, three degrees of their signs. And for those of you who are interested, it's May 2026. Look at the Helio horoscope for that time. This is the biggest time of concentrated and compressed change astrologically that there's ever been in human history. I was born in 1955. When I was born, there was 2.2 billion people on this planet. There's now eight, eight and a half. It's almost quadrupled it's more than tripled in my lifetime when i was born new technology meant a black and white little box in a wood uh, with flickering images and, and a dial-up phone now this downloads zoom when i was born spirituality meant going to sunday school now there's cults enlightenment groups spirituality of all types all over the world I suggest that the escalation of population is matched by the escalation of technology and the escalation of spirituality. And all of these things are on an escalatory curve, getting steeper and steeper. Once an escalatory curve hits prime vertical, only one of two things can happen. Either it crashes in on itself and then starts that long, slow crawl back, going the other way as it previously did, which may have happened 12 and a half thousand years ago at the time of the flood. Or we exceed the parameters of the graph and we break through into a more multifaceted dimension of existence where words like empathy, compassion, kindness, intuition become much more the order of a day than they currently are where we, re we retain identity and individuality but we'll be able to spot immediately when someone is harboring thoughts of malice or violence it's at the same time that i suggest astrology is going to be taught in schools because by the time astrology is taught in schools everyone will know each other will form into natural groups and it will see an end to warfare and violence within two generations. We're heading into the most concentrated time of progressed change in human history. And everyone watching tonight, we will see this because it's all going to happen in the next three or four years. Now, if we, the negative way of looking at this is that we're heading into a dystopian future with more and more pandemics, 
with more and more corporate and government control, the equally strong positive side of this is that we're heading into a time of more compassion, empathy, kindness, where human rights are going to become more and more recognised, where our relationship with femininity, with nature, with spirituality is going to become more and more conscious. And it's not us versus them. It's not a war. It's a test of evolution. Are we fit enough to survive this change, this, this race into the future and progress as a species? Because if we are, we'll be able to go beyond this planet and reach out in a way that has never even seemed possible before. The originators of Star Trek have got a lot to answer for, I suspect. And the thing is, the astrology of the next few years shows that we're on that point of breakthrough or breakdown, of transcendence now. So I, I see this as the most important time in human history. And of course, every generation has always thought they're living in a golden age. And we're no different. But this is something different. And I feel very privileged to be the age I am. I People don't find astrology. Astrology finds people. And if you get that, you realize that astrology is not an it. I call it a she. Astrology's found me. I couldn't, I would not be alive without astrology. So I'm I'm caught up in it. And the Plutonic astrology at this time in my life has caught me big time. That's why I wrote this book, The Law of Pluto, Exploring the Void. And um, that's out in bookshops around the world on October the 10th. I've got signed copies, or I've got copies that I can sign for you and post out to anywhere in the world. It's all on my websites. Um, just a one minute of quick promotion. You can get hold of me at steve at stevejudd.co. Um, my website is stevejudd.co, that's co, although all my books and my teaching courses and my videos are at astrobabbleproductions.com and yes i did patent that name because I, I astro babble and um i haven't got anything more to say let pluto into your life do not fear him go into the dark with your eyes open Feel the fear and do it anyway, knowing that it's going to hurt. But as a result, you will become invulnerable, empowered, and stronger than you ever dreamt possible. Welcome, Pluto, into your life. Now, there are literally hundreds of questions, so I'm going to cherry pick what I see as the best. Um, I know a lot of you, some many of my students, I'm gobsmacked that so many of my students are here. Um, I'm really chuffed to see you, and I'll no doubt speak to many of you on Thursday. Um, the solar system is like a machine in the matrix. Well, uh, not really, because that's too mecha mechanist for me. I, I don't feel that it's that mechanical. There's a um there's a spiritual content to the universe. Um I'm not gonna be looking at individual charts here or individual aspects no um how will pluto's transit of aquarius affect the world more broadly it's really going to emphasize the difference between the notion of the, the old family structures are coming to an end of course we'll still have families of course we'll still nurture our children and bring them up but more and more now, I'm saying to people, look, they might be blood, they might be family, but they're not the same tribe. Go and find your tribe. The original tribes were those who had the same moon sign. The 12 tribes, the 12 disciples. Find your tribe, and it's dictated as much by your chart as anything else. How does hey, one... Steve, do... Steve, you hear me? I can. Yeah, it's, Nicholas. It's Nicholas, yeah. yeah. I also, just so you know... In the Q&A tab, there's four questions there, too. Uh, you see the Q&A tab on the bottom? I do, indeed. Thank you. Yes. You're welcome. To... Um, how does one go into the dark and purge on one's own? 
with trepidation um a squeaky bum and um faith don't be scared be cautious but don't be scared um ice and dark rock with a heart yes beautiful um when jumping dimensions the question is with or without ego oh without ideally but then we'd all become saints i i i got a weird relationship with ego i don't i don't even know what it is anymore i know i like myself as an individual and i'm reasonably proud of myself but i don't want to get pompous with it i think there's a difference between having a strong ego in terms of self-confidence and self-belief as a to use the leonic way of looking at it the negative side of this is arrogance conceit and vanity the positive side of the same equation is pride pride in oneself without being arrogant if that's possible um Do squares to natal Pluto become fixed points in a person's chart that will remain as sensitive points throughout their life? Yes. But the way you manifest these is open to transfer, no negotiation and transformation as you age. Um, right. Let's look at the other questions that came in. There's four questions here. Um, Pluto with the moon. I have to comment on this. Of all of the transits and all of the natal aspects to Pluto, Pluto with the moon has the potential to be the most empowered, strongest, and the most extreme. For example, with sinistry, when one person's Pluto is opposite the other person's moon, it's called the devil made me do it aspect or at least in one of the funny books on astrology I read. So, yeah, Pluto Moon, it's potentially the most strong and the most difficult aspects of all. We get so many hits of a Pluto transit. Are the first couple the most important? The build-up to the transit is really important. Of a Pluto transit, for two, a couple of years before, you will start to feel the immensity, the depth, even a little bit of the fear, you can't stop it. I, I, from 1977, I knew that in 2010, Pluto was going to oppose my son. And I knew there was nothing I could do to stop it. And the closer I got, the more scared I got. And then I just thought, mm, can't do anything to stop this. I might as well dive in head first. So as Pluto passed opposite my son, I went through major facial restructuring i had a lot of implants done i've got a titanium jaw and i experienced pain like i've never experienced before but i deliberately chose to do that on a pluto opposite sun so that i would get the best and i would get the worst overdone with quickly and then feel the best of it and if there's anything massive life-changing like that i would suggest you do it on a major pluto transit on the grounds of feel the fear and do it anyway the after effects of pluto transits dissipate much quicker than the pre preamble to it and yes the, the build-up and the first pass of pluto is often associated with the trauma and the crises and then as you go into the set the middle part of it is much more a time of retrospect reassessment reevaluation. did i get it wrong okay Okay, how can I improve it? Did I get it right? How can I move forward with that? And then the third and final pass or the fifth and final pass of a Pluto transit is when you actually get it right or when you consolidate the bad mistakes you've made and then you're stuck with it for a long time. For those of us who study astrology and practice it, If people, if astrology's found you, you must have something worth saving. You must have something worth working with. And Pluto is not the malevolent misogynist he's made out to be. There is a dark feminine side to Pluto that talks of flowering from within, 
the phoenix rising from the ashes. And I encourage you all to find that. Um, with Pluto retrograde in the chart, and it, it will, in its progressed movement through life, moves closer and closer to aspect. Do I have an opinion on that? I'm not that much of a student to be able to qualify an answer on that. I do use progressions a lot, mainly the progressed sun and progressed moon, because I'm too busy to work with other progressions. And over the course of a lifetime, Pluto will only move by progression one maximum two degrees but if it's moving closer and closer to an aspect i suggest that this suggests a lifetime experience of moving closer and closer to break through or break down what is the relevance of a house or the element of a house hosting pluto um i've often described the horoscope as the aspects of the horoscope are like a cake. The signs of the zodiac are like the icing around the cake. And the houses of the zodiac are the packaging that the cake comes in. Because aspects, in my opinion, are the most important. The houses show how energy manifests in you. And the houses, the, sorry, the signs show how planetary energy manifests in you. And the houses show how the outside world experiences experiences that energy so i consider pluto's transit through a house in your horoscope as far more significant than passing through a sign in your horoscope do i think that males and females will become more blurred and that one's sex will become less important um oh this is a this is a a, a trap of a question because we now have so many different types of gender description just in recent years um which in itself is a reaction to much of the abuse of recent years of recent decades that's all coming to light now thank you pluto and capricorn um i can't see that we will ever become an androgynous species without changing the path of evolution and i kind of hope that personally that never happens uh i have to say no to that question but it's a, it's a bit of a trap because whether you say yes or no there's always going to be different answers here um we're coming to the end so i just want to see if there's any more stuff that jumps out here um um, no, I'm, I'm actually going to say no, and I'm going to call it quits here because I'm going to get out while I'm ahead. Um, <laughs> I've really enjoyed this. Uh, I, I encourage you all, please, study astrology, explore Pluto in your charts, go into the dark, embrace it. Don't be scared. There's nothing there to be scared of apart from fear itself. Pluto will encourage you to go through the dark into the light and then you become more integrated, assimilated and wholesome. And then you become so self-empowered that you can become a catalyst for other people and empower them to change their lives. Thus, the world becomes a better place. Catch you later. Steve, thank you. Thank Pleasure. you for that today. Yeah, that was amazing. And and um, I'm sure everybody is watching the comments here during, I think you've touched on all the different places and ways of Pluto and especially personally appreciated the beginning history of the name and so on and so forth. Um, I, I have a personal tidbit. I say for the first time I went to Flagstaff, Arizona this year, the spring to the Lowell Observatory where Pluto was discovered. And I don't know, have you ever been there, Steve? Have, have no, I, I wish. Some okay. of wish this. It's totally for you. <laughs> they, they, the old telescope where it's discovered, it's like a museum, you can go in there, you can touch it. You, they have a whole tour, a guide to the history of how it was named, the, the contest, you know, that whole story, the whole deal. It, you would love it. Um, and a whole path you walk up to this telescope the history as you walk to it it, it was amazing so um 
totally for you, Steve, totally for you. Um, I want to thank everyone for, for, um, for being here live today. It's, we had a superb turnout. Good work, everybody. Everybody was really good in chat, which I really like to see uh, with good questions and great comments. Um, ending this, I just want to remind everybody here that um, uh, ESAR, uh, the organization, our new website's coming in a couple of weeks. Um, part of being a member of ESAR, one of the biggest things to do it is there's over 450 webinars you can access in different languages. This particular one was free to view live, but only ESAR members can watch afterwards. And so ESAR members get to do that and go through. And even temporarily wise members, I send them a temporary password and they can go through the library that we have now. If something you're interested in down the line, especially after we launched a new website, you're welcome to join. We got another extra caveat. We're going to have forums on our website to encourage great conversation and the sharing of information in, in the broad world that we live in with astrology. And there's many other great things come along along the way. So I want to thank everybody for showing up. And Steve, thank you today. I, I thoroughly enjoyed this. I was absolutely, it doesn't look like it, but I was well, I'm not going to blaspheme, but I was petrified before I came on because I thought, oh, my God, how am I going to cope? Ah! And then I just thought, right, uh, let's go. Um, and I, you know, yeah, for me, over the 15, 16 years I've been involved with conferences and astrology and webinars, whenever I see someone who's been doing astrology and they tell me they're still nervous before, that's a good thing. Uh, uh, this, that means they're still living on the edge, still playing that line of, of like, it's not boring and there's passion involved. It's a performer coming up on stage. That feeling is life, you know? So it's good. It's good. Um, okay, everybody. Um, I'm going to bid farewell to you all and we'll see you on the next webinar. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Bye now. Yeah.